we can now, for the time being, we can go ahead with the program. Uh, now I request Sujata ma'am to kindly introduce Swamiji. Thank you, Vidhu. Swamiji, namaste. Namaste. Pranam Swamiji. Namaste to everyone. I feel blessed to introduce Swamiji today. As we all know, Swami Sarvapyanandiji is the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York since January 2017. He joined the Ramakrishna Mission in 1994 and took final monastic vows in 2004. He has served as an Acharya of the Monastic Provisional Training Center at Belur Math, Kolkata. He has also served in various capacities in different educational institutions of the Ramakrishna Mission India and the Assistant Minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji is an erudite scholar of Advaita Vedanta philosophy and one of the best known speakers of Vedanta in the world today. He has been prominently focused on Indian theories of self, comparative studies of consciousness, philosophy of mind, principal Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and many more Indian philosophical treatises. Swamiji is an Agnar Fellow for 2019-20 at the Harvard Divinity School. He has also been invited to speak at several universities across the world. He has played a prominent role in various interfaith panel discussions, seminars, including speaking at the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto and at the United Nations headquarters in New York in 2018. His unique style of incorporating in his lectures, the teaching, experiences, stories, and parables of Sri Ramakrishna, Master Sharda, Swami Vivekananda, and other great masters of the order, as well as his experiences with various saints and sannyasis during his stay in the Himalayas, makes the philosophy of Vedanta easily comprehensible by the seekers. The clarity, the kindness, the love and affection, and the persuasiveness with which Swamiji explains the philosophy of Advait Vedan are highly admired by his followers. I express my heartfelt gratitude to Swamiji for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk and to interact with our other participants. Now, I humbly request Swamiji to begin the talk. Thank you and Namaste. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sujata Raju. I'm must express my uh, gratitude to Dalatram College, to the philosophy department, and uh, especially to you, Professor Raju, for reaching out to me and making this uh, event possible. Um, am I audible to all of you? Is, it, is this clear? It's clear? All right. Yes. At any point, if, if it gets disturbed, it's not clear, just let me know. So um, let me start with the chant. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality Om Peace Peace Peace. Uh, namaste, everybody. It's a delight to be uh, with you all, even though it's only virtual, but still. And discussing my favorite subject. You know, uh, as, a, as an undergrad uh, studying in India in Bhuvaneshwar, I studied economics. And I didn't know much about philosophy. It's only after becoming a monk that I studied philosophy and I realized it's the best subject in the world. It's the most wonderful, most profound um, the deepest subject that one could study. And if I had to do my undergrad education all over again, I'm sure I would have studied philosophy. So it's always a delight. I never turned down an invitation from a philosophy department. It's always a delight to stu meet students and teachers of the philosophy department. Um, Advaita Vedanta, sometimes, you know, people who love Advaita Vedanta in order to praise it, they say that it is not a philosophy, as if they're saying something great about it. It's not true. I understand what they are trying to say, that it's a direct revelation of the truth or it points you towards the truth. Very good. But it's also definitely a philosophy. 
it is um, if you take up any book on textbook on indian philosophy you will find a chapter on advaita vedanta it is taught in the you know darshan vibhag in the philosophy department of uh, uh, colleges and universities so advaita vedanta definitely is a philosophy it's a darshana i remember when we were brahmacharis at novice monks in belur math uh, near the ganga in calcutta so we had a a professor retired professor of philosophy to teach us a little bit about western philosophy just an introduction to western philosophy and he started off by saying uh, see you must not mix up darshan and philosophy um, that you know darshan means seeing the truth the indian idea of philosophy is a direct experience of the truth that's darshana and philosophy in the western sense is philosophia love of wisdom so it is thinking philosophically about certain subjects that is philosophy and so it's different from darshan and this is the idea that i had for a very long time but seemed odd to me that uh, we would have different ideas of philosophy until i read this book recently by a, by a french philosopher um, um luke um he gives a just a brief uh, uh, you know uh, history of western thought and uh, there he says that philosophy is not the right term for what we do in philosophy departments it's theory and then he gives the etymology of the word theory it, it comes from theos and orao to see ultimate things to see the ultimate truth uh, you know to see the divine truth and then there's our darshan so this is so the the etymological meaning of the term theory and the etymological and the meaning of the term darshan is exactly the same thing actually and that was such a delight to discover anyway the subject today of course is advaita vedanta the the goal and the purpose of life you know if you live it with the philosophy of advaita vedanta uh, another introductory book on philosophy which i had read many years ago i i don't remember anything about that book but just the beginning of that book uh, where it is um yes so that's an important point if you have questions observations please write it in the chat box we will deal with it after the talk uh so in that book i don't remember the name of the book i don't remember the contents of the book but i remember the opening paragraph of the book where he makes the author makes an argument for philosophy for studying philosophy he says if you ask why should we study philosophy um he says that if you do not study philosophy you think that you don't need philosophy and you live your life without philosophy that also is a philosophy a bad one but it's still it's also a philosophy of life so it's much better to be uh, uh, educated in in uh, philosophy um, at least a little bit for everybody and a lot of it for philosophy students um the goal of advaita vedanta is moksha in common with all other indian philosophies except perhaps the charvaka it is moksha there are multiple words for it moksha mukti nirvana apavarga apavarga is an ancient term used in the nyaya philosophy for example uh, and uh, kaivalya so this was a project which uh, ancient indian philosophy had engaged upon so this is i think a distinct feature of ancient indian philosophy which leads many people to confuse it with theology or, or religion in the western sense um i can do no better than to quote heinrich zimmer he says uh, in his book on the philosophies of india he says contrary to the belief that indian philosophies are pessimistic they are not pessimistic they are actually optimistic because they give they seem to paint a very pessimistic view of life that it is full of suffering and unhappiness but they are optimistic because they believe they all believe that there is a solution that there is a way to um, you know profound peace and fulfillment there is a way to overcome suffering so that's optimism for you so this whole philosophy of moksha nirvana kaivalya whatever mukti whatever you call it is actually at 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 the bottom a philosophy of optimism of hope for the whole human enterprise how is it defined what are we looking for when you say the goal of human life is moksha uh, you know i was just re- recently reading one of our senior swamis is speaking about the bhagavad gita and he says that in the gita i don't find jnana bhakti karma dhyana uh, i find only liberation only moksha he is making a rhetorical point uh, of course in the gita you have got karma yoga bhakti bhakti yoga dhyana yoga and jnana yoga all of it is there but the point he is making is it's a moksha shastra 
Gita is a moksha shastra. Upanishads are moksha shastras. The Advaita Vedanta texts are moksha shastras. They are meant to teach us how to overcome suffering and attain fulfillment. So the goal of Advaita Vedanta is Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti Paramananda Praptischa. Uh, the, the utter cessation or the transcendence of sorrow in our lives and the attainment of lasting and deep fulfillment, peace. Ananda Prapti, getting Ananda and Dukkha Nivritti, overcoming suffering. You know, who could dispute this? See, the other way, the traditional way, the goal of Advaita or any other Indian philosophy is put is that we are caught in this chakra, in the cycle of Janma and Mrityu. Uh, there is a birth and death and we are life after life, we are being born. And, you know, sometimes it's a little better, sometimes it's a little worse. And then finally, the goal is to get out of this, this limited existence and attain a, some kind of unlimited spiritual existence. That's, that's the way it is put. But the problem with, with, you know, when you say that to people today, whether here it's in the United States or even in India, um, person, a person might just say that this whole idea of multiple lives and going through this cycle of birth and death, it already presumes that you have accepted the Hindu worldview, you know, not just Hindu, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, the entire uh, Indian worldview that there are multiple lifetimes. Suppose I don't know. Suppose I say, I have only this life. I don't know whether uh, there are past lives or there are future lives. So what can Vedanta do for me in this life? Therefore, it is much better to put it this way. In this life itself, here and now, can we overcome suffering in some deep, meaningful way and attain, um, attain peace, attain fulfillment. So, Dukkha Nivritti, Ananda Prapti. Um, one thing that one should be said before we dive into this is what can Vedanta or any of these philosophies, whether it's Buddhism or Sankhya, what can they actually do for us? When you say remove suffering, there is a nice story I want to share with you. I had actually heard this from Professor Arindam Chakravarti who teaches Indian philosophy at, uh, at Hawaii. At one time, he was here in New York in, at Stony Brook. So in a talk, he started this with a story from the Buddha. I and mean, it's in the original sources, um, uh, in the Pali sources. It seems that late in the Buddha's life, a monk approached him and said, I have a question. What is the question? We, you had started off by seeing that there is suffering in life. You know the story of the Buddha, he saw an old person, a diseased person, and a dead person, uh, old age, disease, death, death uh, um, you know. So um, then suffering is inevitable, how to overcome suffering, that was your quest. Then you found Bodhi and you have taught it to us. So we are supposed to overcome suffering by practicing your teachings. Uh, the Buddha said, then what is your question? The question is, that I find that we are also growing old. We are also getting disease. Uh, and some of us are dying and you are also growing old and you will also get disease and maybe one, and certainly one day you will die. So how did you overcome suffering? You see the question, the simple direct question. You said suffering is old age, disease, death. And you said, I have got a solution to suffering. And you have taught it to us. We are practicing it seriously. The, you know, the Ashtanga, Marga and all that. But we are also growing old. We are also getting disease. And we are dying also. People, some of us are dying. So how have you solved the problem of suffering? Then the and Bhagavan Buddha said, and I think this is very important for students of Indian philosophy. What does it do? Why Indian philosophy? Philosophy itself. What can philosophy do for us? Practical philosophy. It is this. Um, he said that, see, imagine a person hit by one arrow and then by another arrow, two arrows. Imagine the shock that he gets by hit, being hit by an arrow and then by another arrow. Um, the uh, life is like that, you know. What life throws at you, old age, disease, death, disappointment, bad relationships, um, anxiety, that is the first arrow. The second arrow is our reaction to it. How we react to these problems. And Bhagavan Buddha says, it is the second arrow which causes real suffering to us. And what I teach can remove the suffering of the second arrow. It cannot do anything for the first arrow. So first arrow is life itself. 
there will be birth and growth and old age and disease and death and poverty and some failure and humiliation and unhappiness those things will come and go nothing can be done about that however our reaction to it which really causes suffering to us maximum suffering is caused by our reaction any doctor knows this if you ask a doctor they will see they see all kinds of patients very severely ill patients who might sometimes be so calm and dignified and manage their illness you know and not be uh, upset or depressed or sometimes patients with minor illness becoming so upset so depressed so it is really our reaction to the uh, to the world that causes us suffering and that reaction is completely changed by philosophy by buddhism or advaita vedanta or by anything else so it's important to understand at the outset where exactly are we aiming are we aiming to make poor people rich are we aiming to make sick people uh, um, healthy uh, those things can be done and they should be done and they are being done but that's not the subject directly of uh, philosophy philosophy deals with that inner psychological reaction to the world that's the source of real suffering um the unique way that advaita vedanta does it that i want to touch upon so this moksha this nirvana this is the common project of all of indian philosophy with the exception of the charvaka what what is unique about advaita vedanta uh, so i want to dwell on that uh, and then see the benefits of that in our lives as in the rest of this talk so advaita vedanta says that um, you know tattva masi you are that There, there is an ultimate reality of this universe, existence, consciousness, bliss, satchidananda. You are that, and from that perspective, there is no death. Hence, you need not have fear of death. Satchidananda Brahma is is immortal, and if you are Brahman, if you are satchidananda, then you are immortal. You have no fear of death. Um, you are complete. You are purnam. So you have no want, uh, no um, you know. Uh, lack uh, no need for anything from this world um, you are fearless you are always at peace you are always fulfilled and as long as this body lasts you can live the life of a jivan mukta free while living and that's the best kind of life possible you can be you'll be a blessing to yourself and blessing to all those around you so this is the grand vision that advaita vedanta opens up before us in contrast to most other philosophies most other religious world views the goal that advaita vedanta puts before us it's not something separated by you know time or space or object what i mean by that is this it's a simple but very powerful uh, insight you know i sometimes we i drive past uh, billboards here big boards on the side of the road um, which says it's put it put up by some church which says heaven is a place that much only it said there and then call some number then they will charge you some money and they will tell you about uh, god and heaven and by the way this country the united states uh, it's a pretty religious country many people in india would be surprised there's almost a church at every corner of a street and uh, it's, it's a really religious country that way so heaven is a place which means heaven is not here this is a place world and that is another place whereas advaita vedanta does not say that the goal which you are talking about satchidananda brahman whatever it is it's not separated from you by place it's not that here you are not satchidananda brahma after you go to vaikuntha or kailash or something then you will be satchidananda brahma no it says it is there here everywhere another billboard i saw it says after death you will meet god and some church has put up that billboard after death you will meet god look at the language after death after is a time word past and present and future after so not before death after death you have to wait till death and then you will meet god whereas in advaita we say what we are looking for what we are um, you know uh, 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 what we are searching for is not separated from us by time it's not that you have to wait for certain amount of time and then you will um, see brahman or you will become brahman no it is then and it is in the past and in the future it is now also it is all the time and right now also not only that in most in most dualistic theistic traditions the god which we are searching for is not you 
is separate from you. It's there's a um, there is a difference in object vastu. It's a different reality. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, it's not a different reality. It is you. It is you. It is now. It is here. This is an incredible thing. So if it's in spiritual journey in Advaita Vedanta, if it's not a journey in time, it's not a journey in space, it's not a journey from one object to another object, then what kind of a journey is it? It's a journey from ignorance to knowledge, from ajnana to jnana, from avidya to vidya. So in Advaita Vedanta, it is a journey in, uh, from not knowing, not realizing, from ignorance to knowing, realizing, to, um, to realizing our true nature. All of this, which I'm trying, I just said now, of course, in, in Sanskrit or Hindi, it can be said in just three words, desha kala vastu. The ultimate reality you are, you are try, looking for, is it separated from you in desha kala vastu, in space, in time, in object, or not separate? Advaita Vedanta says not separate. It is in all desha, in all kala, and in all vastu, and especially it is now, here, and you. So the journey here is from um, not knowing to knowing. This makes it a, a path of knowledge par excellence, a path of philosophy. In fact, Swami Vivekananda, when he defined religion, uh, he said religion is the manifestation, famous definition, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. And the goal is to manifest this divinity within us. How do you do it? And he gives his famous four yogas. You do it, you know, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raja Yoga. But for Jnana Yoga, notice the word he uses, the original quotation from Vivekananda. For Jnana Yoga, he says, do it by philosophy. By philosophy. So for Jnana Yoga, Swami Vivekananda uses the word philosophy. And of course, love, uh, worship for Bhakti Yoga, uh, service for Karma Yoga and psychic control for uh, Raja Yoga. All right, a quick look of about how do we do it actually? What is the methodology in Advaita Vedanta? You know, in, um, uh, in Bhakti approach, we know what is the methodology, that there is some God and it is told to us in um, textbooks and our, you know, in scriptures and the Guru tells us and you have faith in God and then you worship, you have rituals, you have bhajans, you have prayers. In the path of meditation, dhyana, we know how to do it. You have to sit in a certain way, breathe in a certain way, calm down your mind, shut down the senses, withdraw inwards and focus. That's the path of yoga, meditation. What do you do in the path of jnana, in the path of knowledge? Um, each of these paths has its, the way they have set up the problem and the solution. In the path of bhakti, the problem is, that God exists, but you do not have faith in God. So the solution is that you must have faith in God and you must worship God and surrender to God. So this problem and the solution are matched. In the path of yoga, Patanjali yoga, they will say that the problem is that our minds are restless. Because our mind is restless, we do not see the truth. So the, it is not a question of having faith in God, rather a question of calming down the mind in meditation. If you calm down the mind in meditation, you will see the truth. That's the yogic path. What is the jnana path? What is the advaitic path? It is not, uh, Advaita does not say that you have to believe in some God and have faith in, in God. It's good if you do, but that's not, not the essential path of Advaita Vedanta. It does not even say that you have to do yogic meditation, calm down the mind. It says, of course, you need a calm mind and focused mind, just as you need a focused mind for anything in life. But the unique path of Advaita Vedanta is called vichara, vichara. Inquiry, inquiry. And it's very natural. If, if our goal is knowledge, how will knowledge be produced? Only by inquiry. Only by inquiry. By sitting quietly, knowledge is not produced in meditation. By believing something and uh, having devotion, knowledge will not be produced. Uh, so emotion does not produce knowledge, not even focus. But it's not, it is an inquiry. Inquiry into what? Since the claim, since the claim is that we are Brahman, our real nature is Brahman, and the big claim is that we do not know ourselves as we truly are. Vivekananda, in this country, in America, he would um, sometimes say to the American disciples, uh, in those days, more than 100 years ago, he would say, 
if only you knew yourself as you truly are. If you know yourself as you truly are, then that would so the implication is if you knew yourself as you truly are, that would solve all problems. So how to know ourselves as we truly are? And Vedanta says it requires only an investigation into our experience. What experience? Our daily experience. See, here is the beauty of it: the the bhakti path requires you to have faith. If you don't have faith. your the path of devotion bhakti will not start for you if you start questioning your philosophy students so you will start questioning from the very beginning then it will not work it starts with shraddha or faith the um, yogic path is much more empirical it says patanjali yoga it says that no no not faith do these yogic exercises these meditation techniques then you will get these extraordinary experiences and that will prove to you Uh, the reality of uh, of the claims of spiritual life swami vivekananda was very eminently empirical he would say that um, if god exists i should be able to see god if i have an immortal soul i should be able to feel it so that's a very empirical question so this is the spirit of this age you know that we want to see for ourselves and that's great yogic path gives you these special experiences but that's the problem the samadhi the special experiences the mystical experiences given by the path of yoga are not common very few have them we don't have them as a, on a day to day basis so what happens is uh, if you say i had a mystical experience and i saw god you can doubt it because um, that person may be seeing god but i am not seeing it so what happens to mystics throughout the ages in different religions often mystics were seen as crazy people mad people because they are saying something that the common majority most of us we don't see it in today's day and age a neuroscientist will say that i don't doubt that you are feeling one with the universe or you are seeing some light divine light or something i don't doubt that but that's just because you have some kind of stroke in your brain or some malfunction in in your um, you know in, in your uh, cerebral cortex or something like that and that's why you're getting these experiences or you are high on some drug here they have uh, in new york they recently decriminalized marijuana so around 5 5 five o'clock onwards you will find people all around smoking marijuana half of them are, are high so you are high on some uh, uh, drug and that's why you are getting these experiences it is not spiritual somebody may say that it's just being produced in your brain because of drugs or because of a clot in your brain or some neuro neurological problem how do you overcome this objection Advaita Vedanta has a unique approach. What Advaita Vedanta says is that not faith, not special mystical yogic experiences, but just a experience, just an investigation of our daily experience, an experience everybody has. Who does not have the experience of waking, dreaming, sleeping? All of us. We all have the experience of waking, dreaming, sleeping. So what we ask? Well, Advaita Vedanta says that. that is all that is necessary now we will conduct an investigation of waking dreaming and sleeping and then we will show you the truth of our claims who does not have the experience of you know subject and object that is seeing an object we are all seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or touching so this subject object experience it is a very structure of experience everybody has this so that's that's enough for advaita vedanta to start it does not require any special yogic experience it does not require any special belief system who does not have the experience of you know body mind i am a body and i inside when i introspect i experience a mind if you have that much the pancha kosha method of the physical body and the vital body and the mental body and the intellect body and the causal body pancha kosha method that can be used for investigation so this is another unique feature of advaita vedanta it does not depend depend on faith it does not see people confuse religion with faith all the time um, uh, here in america for example uh, the word for religion is faith when they ask you what is your religion they ask what is your faith so the idea that's why advaita vedanta is not a typical religion it it's it's much more uh, a philosophy and a practical philosophy which will lead us to you know overcome suffering so uh how does it proceed 
uh, I'll give you a quick overview of these, these methods, methods of investigation. Of course, we can't do that in this short span of time, but just to give you a taste. Um, these methods are called prakriyas. Prakriya literally means method or methodology. Methodology of what? A methodology of a philosophical investigation of our daily experience, our quotidian experience, what we are having all the time, that experience. Um, one simple and most powerful way is what is called drig drishya viveka, the, the, the discernment of the seer and the seen. And what it does is, you, the experiencer, the seer, you are distinct from the seen. So just as I'm looking at this book, uh, this book is the scene. I'm looking at the book and I, the, the teaching is that the seer and the seen are different. The book is different. I am different. These eyes are the seer and the book is the scene. Start there. It will proceed in four stages. Now, the eyes are obviously different from the book. And we know the eyes can see things only which are different from the eyes. The only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. I mean, you can see your eyes in a mirror or in a computer screen, but that's just a ref reflection of your eyes or a picture of your eyes. The way my eyes are directly seeing this book, that way my eyes cannot directly see themselves. So the seer and the seen are always different. The subject and the object are different. So what we say, that's pretty obvious. Well, now you go deeper. Consider the eyes themselves. If you blink your eyes, you see that you are aware. The eyes are closed. Eyes are open. I can see well. I cannot see well. So the eyes themselves become the object of your knowledge, object of your seeing, quote unquote. Here seeing means knowledge. Who is seeing now? The mind is seeing. With the mind, you're considering the eyes. Uh, so the eyes are the object. The mind is the seer. The eyes are seen. The mind becomes the seer. Here, of course, not literally seeing, just in the sense of uh, knowledge. Now, the mind is different from the eyes. And that also seems pretty obvious. The eyes are this organ of vision and the mind is something subtle inside which we, um, we cannot objectify uh, easily. And then consider the mind itself. Uh, are we aware of the contents of the mind? Yes, that's what is called introspection. When we look into our minds, uh, we are aware. When we are happy, we are aware we are happy. When we are anxious, we are aware that we are anxious. Uh, when uh, we are joyful, we are aware that we are joyful. Um, so. The contents of our mind are obvious to us. We are aware of the contents of our mind. In that case, our mind is also an object. The movements of the mind, the contents of the mind is also an object. Object to what? Object to you. Now, what is that to which the mind is an object? That is called the drashta, the seer, or sakshi, witness. Witness or not in the sense of an action, in the sense of awareness. Now that awareness, that consciousness itself uh, is not an object. It cannot be objectified. It is that to which everything else is an object. And then we are shown that, notice how the body and its problems like pain and all, they are objects. You are awareness, you are aware of the body. You are aware of even the pain in the body. You are aware, you the witness, you are aware of the mind. You're aware of the contents of the mind. If there is unhappiness in the mind, earlier I would have said, I am unhappy. But now, when I see the unhappiness in the mind, I say, all right, I'm aware of the unhappiness. There's a wave of unhappiness, wave of depression or wave of anger. At that moment, I might not be able to say because uh, the discernment is not clear, it becomes mixed up. But later, I should be able to say that I, uh, it is I who was aware of that wave of anger in the mind. See, already we have shifted the reference of the I. When I say I, aham, I, what do I mean? Who am I? What am I? Usually we mean this bundle. If you say who, are, directly point to yourself. I'll say here, this, this is I, the body. As we investigate deeper, we say, no, not just the body, but the body and mind. By this process of drik drishya viveka, we begin to see body and mind also are objects to awareness. So this is a big step forward. This is not something that is easily uh, recognized in the modern philosophy of mind. Uh, I, I um, took a course. I just wanted to see the latest writings in the philosophy of mind. And so at Harvard University, in the philosophy department, they have, um, by the way, just as an anecdote, 
The philosophy department at Harvard University is called Emerson Building. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, many, many years ago, he was at Harvard. He used to give uh, uh, talks. He once he gave a talk heavily influenced by Vedanta. And the people were so furious with him at that time that he is bringing all these non-Christian philosophies into our university. He was boycotted. He was uh, thrown out of the university and, and barred, banned from coming and teaching in the university. Over time, he became so famous. He became America's greatest philosopher. So, of course, Harvard had to call him back in again. And then now the philosophy department at Harvard University is called Emerson Building, and there's a big statue of Emerson there. And if you see Emerson's writings, they're heavily in influenced by the Bhagavad Gita and the Upash Upanishads. Um, so at Harvard, I took a course on the philosophy of mind. And uh, I noticed, uh, you know, I said, rather, I said there that it seems to me the last person who said anything useful in the philosophy of mind, the modern philosophy of mind, was Descartes, more than 300 years ago, who made the clear distinction between uh, mind and body, and that uh, I think, therefore I am, that the irreducible thing in this, our experience is the sense of I think. Uh, and then he stopped there. And after that, all of modern philosophy, um, philosophy of mind, if you see all the readings there, they neatly they fall into two categories. One is that uh, they try to, uh, they try to see that um, uh, you know, how to reduce the mind into the body and that the mind is nothing but the brain or ne neuronal functioning in the brain. That's the mainstream effort. Or sometimes by the, um, you know, the ordinary language philosophers in, in Oxford, they try to show that what you call mind is just a way of speaking language or the behaviorists try to show that there's no mind. It's just behavior. Anyhow, trying to reduce uh, mind into the body. And the other group of papers in the philosophy of mind is trying to show that, well, it's not working. Um, you know, mind cannot be reduced into the body. All your attempts at showing that mind is nothing but brain, it fails. And this is where this whole state of affairs is in the philosophy of mind. Now, of course, there are new developments with the hard problem of consciousness and panpsychism and all that. Um, I think this basic idea, for this, you don't need Advaita Vedanta, Buddhism, Jainism, um, Sankhya, all of them in Indian philosophy, there's a clear distinction between mind and consciousness. This mind and consciousness distinction, uh, it's not there in the modern philosophy of mind. They keep mixing up mind and consciousness. And I think in seeing some of the papers, important papers, I think that's where a lot of the uh, confusion still lie. And if you make this distinction between mind and consciousness, then some of the confusions could be uh, resolved. Um, how do you make this distinction between mind and consciousness? Very simple. As I said, if you are aware of it, then it's an object. Are you aware of your thoughts? If you try, you can be aware of your thoughts. Pain, pleasure, joy, anxiety, memory, loss of memory, all of these we are aware of. In that case, those are objects. That which is aware, that pure consciousness is not an object. And this is the uh, the, the finding that all the prakriyas, uh, they show, uh, whether it is the in analysis through the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep in the Mandukya Upanishad and Mandukya Karika, that we, our, all of our daily life, broadly speaking, we are awake, then we fall asleep and have a dream state, and then we have a deep sleep state, and then we come back. But all these states come and go to you, the one consciousness. It is you who experience awaken, the waking, world of waking and you as the waking person. It is you who experience the world of dreams and you as the person in the dream. And you who experience the blankness of deep sleep. And again, you are the same one who is experiencing this waking world. Now, you phenomenologically. See, here is an important, simple but important distinction to hold on to. I remember one Swami giving a talk in Calcutta University. Is talking about in deep sleep, there is no body, no mind. And then a gentleman stood up in the audience and indignantly he said, what do you mean there's no body in deep sleep? I can see that fellow, he's snoring and lying on the bed. So the body is there. Yes, from your third person pers perspective, from outside. We're saying from your perspective, the deep sleep perspective, inside, what does it feel like? In your deep sleep experience, phenomenologically, what does it feel like? Phenomenologically, it's a feeling of no body, no thinking also, no state of ego, no sensory experience. And 
yet a kind of blankness, not knowingness, and yet no, not an absence of, uh, of consciousness. And there are a lot of arguments to show that consciousness still continues uh, in, in deep sleep, except that there's nothing to be conscious of. Uh, so that's deep sleep. So this one underlying consciousness, what Drik Drishya Viveka reveals, the Avastatra Vichara, the analysis of the three states, reveals that same one consciousness. And if you go through the Pancha Kosha Vichara shown in Taittiriya Upanishad, it will reveal the same one consciousness. So these are different prakriyas, each of them capable of revealing this one consciousness. And, but remember, when we are using consciousness only, in the, only because that's the closest word that we can use in English. And the word used in Sanskrit is not exactly consciousness. Chaitanya, Chit, um, Samvit, uh, bo, um, Bodhi. The, these, are not, these are not the words which are actually equivalent to consciousness. Uh, again, there will be confusion because, uh, for example, it's a basic ABCD in Buddhism that the Pancha Skanda includes consciousness. There's a Vijnana Skanda. So that Vijnana Skanda is not the Chit of uh, Advaita Vedanta. In fact, the chit of Advaita Vedanta is sort of analogous or more or less similar to the, you know, the Buddha nature or the unlimited sky of consciousness, which sometimes Tibetan Buddhism speaks about. So it's similar there. All right. So what? Now you know this. I am the witness consciousness. Does not mean the world will disappear for you. Does not mean the body will disappear for you. Life will go on. But you knowing that you are pure consciousness, you have a place of security, of safety, that it does not grow old, it does not die with the aging of the body, with the death of the body, you are untouched. This is the basic insight. Now, one more thing. Up to this, what I have said is Sankhya. It's not Advaita Vedanta. Because Sankhya is a fundamental dualism. Prakriti Purusha, consciousness matter. We have divided. Subject, object, we have divided. Um, now, Advaita Vedanta asks the question, we have abstracted consciousness from our experience of the world. Here is the world out there. Here is my sensory system. Here is the body. Here is the mind. And I am pure consciousness, observing all of it, or illumining. And these words are also within, within quotes. Uh, but what is the relationship between this vast external universe the universe there and the body and the internal universe of the mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, all of that. What is its relationship to consciousness? Are they different? Till now you said they are different. And Sankhya stops with this difference. Sankhya is a radical duality. But Advaita Vedanta says that the two cannot be different. And the two, two entirely distinct realities cannot interact. In fact, this was the uh, this is the central insight of the Adhyasa Bhashya, masterful introduction to the Brahma Sutras by uh, Shankaracharya. That the two, if they were entirely distinct, they could not interact. Notice that we have really no proof of the external world apart from awareness, apart from consciousness. Uh, it is our, so what we call external world is still within consciousness. I'll give you an example, very nice example to illustrate what I mean. Uh, we have our senior most member in this Vedanta society um, is Bill Conrad. He is 98 years old. He's a veteran of the Second World War, a biophysicist. So he is a reductive materialist, no, physics. So he said, how can this universe be in, in consciousness? Suppose I give you, an, give you an experiment, Swami. We put a camera in this room. And then we record and we leave this room. The camera is recording. Now we have gone. We are conscious beings. We have left the room. No consciousness here. The room is there. Camera is recording. When we come back into the room and look at the film in the camera, look at the recording, we will see the room kept on existing. It's not in our consciousness. It exists outside. A camera recorded its independent existence outside consciousness. So what do you mean that the world exists in our consciousness? Yes, we experience the world in our consciousness, but it exists outside our consciousness. Then we get it through our sense organs into our consciousness and we experience it. So that's basically the realist worldview. Now, what is my answer? What would be the Advaitic answer to it? I mean, it's not just Advaitic answer. Even a phenomenologist like, say, Husserl would give the same answer. Uh, what is the answer? Answer is, I said to Bill, Bill, in your awareness, 
we set up this experience in your consciousness. You are aware of it, right? In your awareness, we set up this experience, uh, experiment. In your awareness, we left the room, both of us. In your awareness, in your consciousness, we came back into the room. In your consciousness, we saw the film in the camera. In your consciousness, we saw the empty room being displayed in, in the uh, camera, in the, in the picture in the camera. At which point did you leave your consciousness? Did you jump out of your consciousness? Everything that we do, it's still within, within consciousness. So that made him think a bit. That's not the usual way we think normally. There's, we have a generally a realist way of looking at the world. So um, it's a very radical claim that this external unit, so-called external universe is not actually external to us. It is an appearance in our own consciousness. Advaita Vedanta says, it is consciousness itself. It is chit itself appearing to itself as the object. Now this, the implication of this is radical, is dramatic. It says, um, it, it means that we are literally one with the universe. It's not that you are consciousness and the whole universe is separate from you. No, you are consciousness and the whole universe is one with you. They, it, and entirely you alone who appears to yourself as this universe. So this, this Swami Vivekananda said, the whole of Advaita Vedanta teaching can be summarized in two propositions. The divinity within us, our own divinity, and the oneness of existence. What is the divinity within us? This pure consciousness. I am not the body, not the mind. The Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. Pure consciousness. I am of Shiva nature. And what is this oneness of the existence? This entire all of existence is nothing but this one consciousness, this Satchidananda. This has tremendous implications. For example, ethics. Just one example. Powerful example is of ethics. Um, the most common idea of ethics in all the religions of the world is what is called the golden rule. That, uh, and all religions of the world have this, that you should uh, treat others the way you would want to be treated. So the question of what is right and what is wrong and why should I be good? is uh, You treat others the way you, should, you want to be treated. Uh, this is a golden rule. You find it in every religion of the world. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Bhagavad Gita says that um, um, Sukhamba Yadiva Dukkham, that saw Yogi Paramo Mata in Gita, it is said that you see the sufferings of others as your own suffering, the happiness of others as your own happiness. And that Yogi is the greatest Yogi. So, again, the same golden rule. Most strongly, you see it in Buddhism. Um, say, uh, for example, Bodhicharya Avatara uh, of Shanti Deva, where you see this that the suffering of others has to be removed. Why? Because it's suffering. There's no question of others and myself. Just as my own sufferings I, I try to remove, I should try to remove the sufferings of others because dukkattvat, because it is suffering. So this is the golden rule. Now the question is, and here, right now, for example, here in the New York, you have the headquarters of the United Nations, the UNO headquarters. If you go there on the third floor, you will find a big sculpture. Uh, the golden rule of all religions. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It was put there by um, Nancy Reagan, the wife of President Ronald Reagan. So that is the, the ethical doctrine which runs through the ethics of the United Nations. But the question is, why? I clearly recognize the difference between myself and others. You say that, remove everybody else's suffering, uh, treat others' suffering as your own suffering. But why? They are others. They are not me. I will take care of my own suffering because it is my own suffering. And um, your suffering does not matter to me because it is your suffering. What is the answer to this question? We feel this difference between myself and others. Why should we, um, uh, why should we ignore that difference? Here is the answer. From an Advaitic perspective, the difference between oneself and others is an illusory difference. It's a body-based difference. As bodies, we are different. It's a mind-based difference. As minds may be, also may be different. But as the underlying reality of this body-mind, the, the, you know, the very nature of this body-mind, which is pure consciousness, and underlying gives the impression of body is there, mind is there, and there's one more atma underlying. No. Yeah. So body-mind, the very nature of this universe, body-mind, is this pure consciousness. And there we are one. If you realize yourself as the atman, as pure consciousness, you will also automatically realize you are one with the universe. 
and therefore ethics why should i be good why should i not hurt others because as you do not want to hurt yourself even as a body mind similarly you would not want to hurt others because the others are you yourself this one this is the basis of ethics why should i be good why should i not uh, hurt others because others are not others they are one with you they are your own expression you exactly what you yourself are um so this is one idea ethics which flows from that once we have some understanding of this i'll just conclude with this and then we will take up some q and a see um swami vivekananda what is the benefit of all this swami vivekananda was once um, told by robert ingersoll when vivekananda came in the late 19th century here ingersoll was a, a very well known agnostic speaker so he told vivekananda that um, i just believe in this life and i want to squeeze the orange dry you know get every drop from it i don't need your god and spirituality and all that and vivekananda said i too believe the same thing but i know a better way of squeezing the orange dry i know that i cannot die therefore i am not in a hurry uh, i have no fear therefore and therefore i can enjoy the squeezing of this this orange and squeeze the orange of life uh, in this way get 10000 times more get every last drop spiritual life is not life denying whatever spiritual life whether advaita or any other path it is actually connecting us with life enabling us to enjoy life and to do much more deeply um, uh, with without fear without want in peace and in joy we will be happy in life and we will meet death with with uh, with calmness and serenity so this beautiful you know this, this is like the fulfillment of life this is the promise of uh, of advaita vedanta and it does not have to be that you will become enlightened and then only you will get the result uh, as we investigate this deeper as we practice a little more we will keep getting the benefit all of these spiritual paths are like that the more you practice the more benefit you get right now you don't have to wait for moksha nirvana or those that will come but before that you get get these benefits all the time um just one more word the whole of vivekananda's program of social action this is sometimes advaita is seen as world denying in classical advaita to some extent it may have been true the same advaita reinterpreted by vivekananda in this day and age the entire um, you know program of social action by the ramakrishna mission all the schools colleges hospitals and they are not social service in that sense it is the idea is shiva gyane jeeva seva to serve all sentient beings knowing them to be none other than shiva uh, and it's not just the ramakrishna mission now it's some it's some ideology that's shared by many many organizations ngos across the across india especially so notice how the advaita philosophy becomes a basis uh, for not only personal enlightenment but for social good i think i can go on and on but i'll stop here and then we can uh, interact thank you so much thank you uh, swami ji you have really Should helped I... us hello yeah yes you have really helped us attain a new found clarity on our lives and times thank you so much swami ji i will take uh, the first question uh, from priya who is our third year philosophy honors student swami ji she is asking uh, two questions she says you have experienced both the lives of an undergraduate student and a monk firstly what is the major difference or differences you have found between these two type of lives in second what is the one advice you would like to give us the undergraduate students as we have just begun our journey to explore philosophy all right um the first one what difference do you find life of a student and a monk well, nobody has asked me that question earlier so i have to think about it um one immediate answer that comes to mind is you know when i became a st- student just like most of you well we got into college why because we have finished school the next thing is college and you are studying this subject i have to study some subjects so i am studying this um there was no clear goal 
And most people do not have any clear goal in life. Um, you know, sometimes they may have some career goals, but that's all. Whereas if you go to a monastery and ask a monk, and I'm not just saying our own monastery, I think any monastery in the world, in any religion, if you ask a monk there, why are you here? There is guaranteed that the monk will be able to tell you clearly what I'm doing here because it's a specialized form of life and you will not take it up unless you have a clear goal in mind. So that's a big difference between um, you know, being a student and then becoming a monk. Um, I became a monk because I have a clear goal in life. When Swami Vivekananda says, Atmano Mokshartham Jagat Hitayacha, uh, for your own liberation and for the welfare of the world. So I sort of internalized that goal. I, I, if that's my goal in life. That's what I'm doing. Um, I think there is learning that can be taken away from this. It's, as a student, why as a student? Student, teacher, um, you know, person working in the world, raising a family. Every one of us should have a clear goal. And the goal can, ch can change and it can be very private. You don't have to tell anybody. And I think the best goal is this most general goal, a spiritual goal. Uh, that uh, I, I can put it in the words of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was, uh, you know, he says, when people ask me, who am I? My answer is, uh, no, when people ask, who am I? Some people think that I am a freedom fighter. Other people think that I am a social reformer. Some people think I am a politician. But if you ask me, Gandhiji is saying, if you ask me, then I am a simple man in search of God. See, that I am a simple person in search of God is something, that's a goal that we should all have as an ultimate goal in our life. Some, we are searching for spiritual enlightenment. So wherever we are, you can be so even as a student I, I had this urge and then of course as a monk that's what i'm following so that's one thing we should have and we can have other goals also and the goals can change no problem but uh, at any point we should be we should feel that i'm being motivated by some goal second question is a very nice question what is the one advice you'd share to us with for students of darshan or philosophy love your subject be excited by it i i tell you there is no subject like philosophy it's the deepest of all subjects. It's the deepest, most profound of all subjects. Uh, it deals with the greatest questions of humanity. If there's one subject that one should study, it is philosophy. Don't be overburdened by uh, coursework or examinations. Just study and read for enjoyment. Even sometimes if you're, some texts are difficult, but if you're fascinated, just read it. You become familiar with it. You will read it again and again later on in life. But this, uh, you know, this joy, this fascination, this pleasure uh, in philosophy, especially when you're exploring for the first time, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, read uh, voraciously, um, you know, read as much as possible uh, and uh, think about it. Uh, think about it, talk about it. Um, I have seen, uh, unfortunately in India, because of the overwhelming importance of, um, of um, engineering and uh, medicine, Everybody wants to get uh, become a doctor or an engineer or get an MBA. Um, our uh, you know, humanities are suffering, especially philosophy is suffering. The situation here is also not uh, much better. But here at least um, some, some of the top universities, they, they are very, uh, very particular about maintaining the philosophy departments. And uh, um, I see the students who take up philosophy here, they take it up because they, they love the subject or they are very curious, they're very eager to learn answers to this deep questions of human life. What is the ultimate reality? Who am I? What is the point of life? What is the best life possible? What should I do with life? And what are the different um, theories and ideas of the great minds through the centuries? People are excited about these subjects. So uh, one example I can share with you also is my one experience I ha had just a couple of years ago at Harvard University in the Harvard Divinity School, I found that the grad students, um, they, they were of two categories. One was they were studying philosophy and religion. So some of them were studying it so that they could become academicians. It's like a job, they're studying it. But because it's philosophy and religion, I found many of the students, the grad students there, they have a spiritual quest. They're genuinely interested in knowing the answers to the great questions of life. Um, so some, and many of them are uh, 
um, are spiritual practitioners. Some of them, they were Buddhists um, or some belong to some other tradition. And they were studying, so they were academically studying philosophy. And in their personal life, they were practical philosophers. They were actually pursuing a spiritual path. Swamiji, uh, next question is from Shubhi, our third year honors student. You mentioned how moving from ignorance to knowledge of our true nature can help us overcome sufferings. What exactly is meant by knowing our true nature? And how can it help us overcome sufferings? Right. A good example would be when you awaken from a dream, you know, suppose in a dream, I was in, in some serious trouble, maybe um, a typical dream we get, I'm going to catch a train, I'm late for the train, I'm not getting the, the, to the station in time, the train will leave, anxiety is there, suddenly I wake up, there is no train, no being late, no station, no anxiety, nothing. This waking up from an appearance into the truth, from the dreaming to the waking, it solves the problem, does it not? What seems to be a huge problem in the dream, it's completely gone when you wake up. Um, one might say, well, the dream totally disappeared. That's why the problem is gone. But in, uh, in actual life, this life will not disappear. Even after all your Advaita Vedanta and everything, life will still continue. No, it's not just a question of disappearing. Your whole paradigm will change. See, the world disappears. Every time we fall asleep, the world disappears. That does not solve the problem of the world. Disappearing is not the sol um, solution of a problem. Solution to the problem is to see that you are higher or deeper than the problem and you're not touched by it. Um, so when I realize that I am the witness consciousness, this is the meaning of realizing what is my true nature. How do I realize that? All those methods I told you, and if you want more detail, of course, um, I mean, what I told you is just very superficial. Um, if you have to, if to go, each of them, will. there are texts and you need to study them. Um, when you go through that, you begin to see that I am not this person Sarva Priyananda. I am this impersonal awareness in which is appearing the mind and personality of Sarva Priyananda. So when I get this huge sense of, of a distance from this little person and a sense of oneness with others, my whole attitude will change. I will not be so anxious about what happens to this little person. Also, I will not have a relationship of you know, anger or competition or jealousy with others because they are, I and they are one. I, I am the same one consciousness here as it is there in that body and mind. So that's what, how it will help. It will change my attitude towards myself, to the world and to other persons. So, uh, Swamiji, uh, Daniel is asking, in theory, the essence of Vedanta philosophy teaches the oneness of all beings. But when the philosophy is taken in the field of political movements, we see that in our country, it can otherize certain sections of the community. Can we call this a contradiction or a gap in theory and practice? What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, it's not easy to politicize Advaita Vedanta. You know, because uh, politics, somebody told me, politics is possible in the personal. If you have an impersonal uh, principle, it's difficult to politicize it. Uh, for example, it's difficult to politicize science because it's the same for everybody. In every country and every person, if you understand science, it's the same for everybody. Similarly, Advaita Vedanta, it really doesn't depend on whether you are a Hindu or um, you know, Buddhist or, or Christian or atheist. The claim that Advaita Vedanta makes is this is the very nature of, uh, this is our real nature. No matter what we believe or think or understand or don't understand. I remember one sadhu in, in, the, in Gangotri telling me, um, this, is a very this is a very paradoxical philosophy, O, o Mahatma. Tum mano ya na mano, jano ya na jano, tum hi Ram. You may agree or you, you may accept it or not accept it. You may know it or you may not know it, but you are Rama. That means you are, you are one with the divine. So, uh, to politicize this, it's, it's difficult. Um, how, to politicize is you need self and the other. So, uh, uh, you 
how will i say you are different from me or you are an other to me in advaita vedanta i can't say it the other might you know that if uh, other people might say that we don't agree with you we think that your philosophy or religion is wrong so that might be the point of view of uh, uh, other, other uh, you know other religions other points of view but from an advaitic perspective i don't see how you can uh, politicize it. it it's difficult and in india in general politicization of religion you might say that it's obviously there no it's not really there uh, I, i really don't agree because um with this old idea of ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti the truth is one and the wise speak of it differently um so a variety of views advaita vishishta advaita dvaita and other schools of vedanta multiple schools of vedanta nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga multiple schools of buddhism and jainism all of these were prevalent and at the same time in uh, ancient and even up to medieval india and they, it's not that they all agreed nicely no no they did not they had fierce debates among each other and that's a sign of a of a vibrant intellectual life and vibrant philosophical life i think one of the uh, greatest periods of development of indian philosophy was nearly 1000 year debate between the orthodox um, schools the vedic schools uh, and the buddhists the main contention was is atma there or not atma versus anatma uh, the existence of god and uh, this debate went on for nearly 8 to 9 centuries who won that's not important but one thing one was indian philosophy won because over a period of 7 800 years on both sides philosophy became very subtle very highly advanced i mean i study western thought here uh, philosophy now in many many cases um, the developments which are coming over the last 1 2 300 years have already been pre-shadowed in india in some ways or the other these various philosophical perspectives were explored and yet my point is that i'm not rambling here my point here is that at no point was it politicized so there was there were buddhist kings and jaina kings and hindu kings and there was rivalry among these groups and yet uh, it was never a question of you know adopting a particular religious uh, perspective and then othering the others and then you know so so this is not in in indian culture and it's very difficult to do that i think though it can be done to you you can be the victims of it and the, it is very much for example here in the united states it's it's common it's just the just the way people think if you are democrat then um, as a republican i'm completely against you so there is no middle ground more and more and uh, so everybody has to take sides and it's it's very either this or that Uh, both cannot be true together this kind of thinking is very common here in the west but not so in india swami ji uh, jyoti is asking since emotions do not produce knowledge but at the end of the day we are emotional creatures in a certain way our mind will be bound by our emotions how does one set a parallel between these two yes now i said emotions do not produce knowledge but there's a there's a lot of literature which is coming out of modern positive psychology and all which shows how emotions if they even if they do not directly produce knowledge they heavily influence our knowledge seeking activities um the thinking fast and slow daniel kahneman he got a nobel prize for his work in economics for showing how uh, our decision making so called rational decision making is it always influenced by irrational emotions um so it, it is not really true what i said that emotions do not produce knowledge maybe they literally do not produce knowledge but they have a very important role in producing knowledge for example you as i just said you as students of philosophy you will learn philosophy you will become masters of philosophy only when you have this tremendous emotion that i love philosophy i enjoy philosophy i delight in philosophy then only see with, without that emotional impetus you will not progress uh, so uh, emotion may not directly produce knowledge but it is absolutely necessary so the question is very good how can they be in parallel they have to be in parallel um, this this is where the beauty of the bhakti sects come in 
So in, in the devotional sex, what is done is the emotions, our emotions are um, uh, guided towards uh, spiritual life. In fact, there is an understanding among those who pursue the path of knowledge, the monks in the Himalayas, they say that if you are on a devotional path, bhakti, you don't need the knowledge path, jnana or advaita path. You proceed on your own. But if you are on an advaita path, as a beginner, as a beginner, it's very good to have bhakti. Why? The problem is this. See, at least at the initial stage, advaita operates at the level of the intellect. I'm saying initial carefully. Um, Whereas our real problems are not intellectual problems. In day-to-day -day in life, our real problems are emotional problems. And the emotions are deeply tied up with the world, with people in the world, with things in the world, with my life in the world. And that's what it binds us to the world. And it is no matter how much we argue and investigate, I am pure consciousness, it will not feel real. It will feel like a theory. So the emotions have to be purified and freed from their worldly entanglements. And bhakti does that very well. Instead of, say, your bhakti towards Krishna, for example. Instead of love, hate, jealousy in the world, uh, anxiety, fear in the world, all of that can be channeled to Krishna. I love Krishna. Uh, um, I'm, if I'm jealous, I'm not jealous of people in the world. I am, quote-unquote, jealous of holy people who are able to love Krishna much more than me. Uh, I, if I am fear and anxiety, it should be regarding my spiritual life with Krishna, not with, with the world. You see, as more and more this, uh, our emotions become concentrated on divinity, we leave the world alone. Advaita becomes more effective then. So bhakti is very helpful for Advaita. Emotions are very helpful and necessary. Purification of emotions is very necessary for Advaita Vedanta. Uh, otherwise, it won't work. Without that purification of emotions, what will happen is, study Advaita, it will feel like a theory. Uh, it promised that it will take you beyond suffering. So I've read all the books, but I have not gone beyond suffering. It doesn't seem to be working, it's just like a theory. So um, the complete system of Advaita says that Advaita Vedanta is at the top. Very good. Jnana Yoga is at the top. Very good. But the base is, must be strong. The base is Karma Yoga, um, selfless action, purifying the mind. Bhakti Yoga, diverting our uh, emotions away from the world towards God. And Raja Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, focusing the mind. Meditation is very important. We don't know how distracted and, and uh, you know, disturbed our minds are. Anybody who has tried meditation seriously for, say, 15 30 minutes, 30 minutes in a day, we all know. We are surprised to see how, how much our minds are flickering all the time. With that kind of mind, no higher pursuit is possible, let alone Vedanta or anything like that. Even higher academic pursuits are not possible. See, just to be, say, to write a paper, to, uh, to, to read a book on higher philosophy seriously, you, if you are emotionally disturbed, if you are anxious, if you are fearful, if you are um, uh, angry, you can't. You cannot focus on, on these high thoughts if the mind is not, not uh, stable, mind is not calm. So calmness of mind, purity of our emotions, and the general selflessness, general lack of worldliness. That is, these are good conditions for the further pursuit of Advaita Vedanta. Swamiji, uh, Divya is asking, Vedas mention that ultimate reality is existence as well as consciousness. Then in which sense would we understand the non-living beings as conscious? And the second Correct. question is, uh, do you mean to say that things exist because we are conscious of them? When you mm. mentioned that the world exists in our consciousness. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so both of these uh, questions are very good. Um, first of all, the question of non-living things. Let me give you an example. So Divya, uh, when you dream, suppose in your dream, you are walking around, there's a garden, there are people there, you are there. It's a dream, but you don't know it's a dream. And, and there are non-living things also, like the rocks or the sky, non-living things are there. Now, when you wake up, you will realize that both the so-called living things and the non-living things in the dream were nothing but your mind. Your mind alone 
projected like a virtual reality. Nowadays, it's easy for us to understand virtual reality. No. So like a virtual reality, your mind projected a dream. And in the dream, there were living things and non-living things. But both the living and non-living are nothing apart from the dreaming mind itself. So mind, which is, a con which is illumined by consciousness, can appear as living and non-living things also. Exactly like that, Advaita Vedanta claims consciousness or Brahman, here consciousness means existence consciousness, Satchit, that appears as this entire universe, including conscious minds like yours and mine, including our bodies, including the external world of so-called living and non-living things. So living and non-living distinguished by the presence or absence of prana. But underlying uh, the Brahman is the same. Uh, how would I say it's the same? Just instead of thinking of consciousness, think of existence. So the non-living things, do they exist? You'll say obviously. But the very existence of those things is Brahman. Brahman. Um, if for example, out of gold, you make uh, a horse, uh, a, a, a mouse, a human being, and a carriage, uh, and a house. You will say the carriage and the house are non-living, and the horse and the mouse uh, elephant are living. But all of them are the same reality, <laughs> which, is, which is basically gold. But there is this underlying reality. Now, the second question is, uh, because you're philosophy students, you have to take this very carefully. Um, there is something called subjective idealism. In the West, Bishop Berkeley, uh, he said that uh, in everything that exists is an idea in the mind. It is all in the mind and it's not external. Advaita Vedanta is not subjective idealism. In fact, um, the closest that we have to subjective idealism in the Indian tradition is the Buddhist Vijnanavada, the Yogacara Vijnanavada of ancient Indian Buddhism, which is also part of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So it is all in the mind. Uh, but Advaita Vedanta says external world and mind both are appearances in consciousness. Um, again, use the dream example. In the dream, when you meet other people, you are there and somebody else is there you're meeting. Obviously, they also have, it seems that they have mind, you have a mind. When you wake up, all of those minds and bodies and world, they were all part of your dreaming mind. So mind and the world both appear in, um, in consciousness. Uh, subjective idealism would say what you are saying, the second question, that this world is in my, uh, in my consciousness, means in my mind, not in that sense. Uh, rather, you, the consciousness, you now appear as Divya, the person with that body mind and with the personality of Divya, and you appear as your as Divya's world, and you are interacting and experiencing. Swami Vivekananda said in one of his poems, "One alone exists. It appears as nature and soul. It appears as object and subject, and exp and interact. But underlying it is one reality. That's Advaita Vedanta." Uh Swamiji, there is a slightly long question, but what she's asking is, uh, this is Mansi Rana, she's asking, uh, she's curious about the language Advait Vedanta uses. Um, uh, she finds it quite paradoxical. Um, and she says that if we see analytic tradition, language has been seen as a tool to grasp or analyze what is real. However, in Advaita, the language used does not really help us to catch hold of some things. In fact, it appears that it rather makes us realize the limitations of language itself. However, conceptual thinking is conditioned by the dichotomous language. So what exactly is the function of language in Advaita Vedanta? Excellent question, excellent question. Uh, see, the analytic tradition in modern Western philosophy uh, you know, the closest I can think of it is, is Nyaya in India and even Navdya Nyaya. Um, so the most analytic language that you can grasp is, is um, uh, that you can have is Navdya Nyaya language actually uh, developed in India about a thousand years ago. Now, those traditions, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Navdya Nyaya also, they are realistic traditions. And in one of the assumptions there is language and reality are parallel. You can grasp reality through language. And the function of language is to reveal reality. But there are other traditions 
ಲೈಕ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಲೈಕ್ ಸೇ ಮಧ್ಯಮಕ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದ ನಾಗಾರ್ಜುನ ವಿಚ್ ಸೇ ದಟ್ ಆರ್ ಈವನ್ ಯೋಗಾಚಾರ ಬುದ್ಧಿಸಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಸೇ ದಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಗ್ರಾಸ್ಪ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ದೇ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅ ವ್ಯವಹಾರಿಕ ಪರ್ಪಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಎನೇಬಲ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಬಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ದೆನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಅಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ವಿಲ್ ಫೇಲ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಸೊ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ದ ರೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ದಿ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯೆಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಉಪನಿಷದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಆಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ದೇರ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ದ ಅದ್ವೈತಿನ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಿಗ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಟೀಚ್ ಆರ್ ಶೋ ದಿಸ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಯೂಸಿಂಗ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಗ್ರಾಸ್ ದಟ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಸೊ ದೇ ಡಿವೈಸ್ಡ್ ಮೆನಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಟಜೀಸ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಐ ಗಿವನ್ ಅ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಡಾಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಲುಕ್ ಅಪ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಹೋಲ್ ಟಾಕ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಟ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ವೈ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಗ್ರಾಸ್ಪ್ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ಲಿ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ರೀಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಡೂ ಅಂಡ್ ವಾಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಡೂ ಅಂಡ್ ಶೋಸ್ ವೈ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಆಪರೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿಚ್ ಎಕ್ಸೀಡ್ಸ್ ದ ಕೆಪಾಸಿಟೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಕೇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಡೂ ಇಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ದೆನ್ ಹೌ ವಿಲ್ ಯು ಯೂಸ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ವೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಟಜೀಸ್ ಒನ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಟಜಿ ಇಸ್ ನೇತಿ ನೇತಿ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ದಿ ಅಪೋಫೈಟಿಕ್ ಮೆಥಡ್ ದ ನೆಗೆಟಿವ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ನೆಗೆಟಿವ್ ಅ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಸೇ ವಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಟ್ ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸೇ ವಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ನೋ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಾಡಿ ನೋ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ನೋ ದಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸೇ ವಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ negatively you can indicate brahman and then hopefully you will get it that is one approach that is taken in advaita vedanta regarding language another approach is um, using paradox further than the furthest nearer than the nearest greater than the greatest smaller than the smallest no upanishads use that language it is known to those who do not know it to those who know it it is not known paradoxical language not that these are this is just to sound cool you know Uh, but no they have very precise meaning if you grasp what is being meant then all of these paradoxes will become clear to you but it cannot be said straight because language cannot express it directly um yeah so i think there is a talk paradox of language advaita vedanta paradox of language uh, i gave a talk it's probably available on youtube tarang i think we are exceeding time tarang oh, yes Uh, there is uh, let me just yes, mention yes, there is a book john grish uh, grisham um advaita vedanta philosophy of language if you look it up john grisham i think okay advaita vedanta philosophy of language no it's john vitanki um vitanki maybe but grisham also let me just uh, take a look um philosophy of language um let me just take a look advaita <clears throat> um John Grimes sorry John Grimes not Grisham uh, G R I M E S G R I M E S Grime um he has I think he has a book on the philosophy of language please look it up grimes g r i m e s he has got a book on um i think he has probably okay yes so are there any other questions good i think we can wrap it up 
Tarang? I think she's disconnected. Did you? Can you, yes, can yes, you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Monica. Tarang is disconnected, I think. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you, Swamiji. Thank you very, very much for, uh, I mean, taking up these questions very patiently and answering them. There were many more questions, but I think we are uh, running short of time now. We were already yes. exceeded time. Now I would request Dr. Monica Prabhakar to um, close the session and propose a word of thanks. Before I have to take a picture. We've already yes, done that. Okay. Okay, so namaste. Um, we heard Swamiji, we reflected on what he said, and uh, undoubtedly we have been enlightened and energized. Now it is time to thank. So on behalf of the philosophy department of Dalatram College, University of Delhi, first of all, I would like to thank our speaker, respected Swami Sarpriyanandji for making time for us in his busy schedule. Our infinite thanks to you, Swamiji, for this excellent talk. It was extremely enriching. We all are inspired and enthralled by your highly lively way of presenting such a deep philosophy. Personally, it was an honor for me to hear my teacher's name from you. Professor Arindam Chakravarti was my MA teacher when he was in Delhi University. So thank you, Swamiji, thank you so much. Next, I would like to express our gratitude to our principal ma'am, Professor Savita Roy, for her constant guidance and motivation. I would also like to thank our vice principal, Professor Sarita Nanda, for her unflinching support. A heartfelt thanks to the faculty members and students of Dolatram College for their active participation. Last but not the least, a big thanks to the participants from outside Dolatram College uh, especially Professor Godabarish Mishra from Nalanda University for your presence and interest in the webinar. With these words, we move to the end of the webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care and stay well, everybody. Pranam Swamiji. Namaskar, Namaskar. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you so much. Okay, we can leave the session, Vidhu. I think, Hanji. Session leave, Karina. Ha, we can leave the meeting now. Take it. Tarang, where are you, Vidhu? Tarang, hai hai. Tarang, have Sister you stopped recording? Questions, large questions, put to get the Tarang. Tarang is problem internet medical.